Good morning and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Chemical and Cultural Strategies for POA Annual Control on Golf Courses, presented by PBI Gordon and taught by Sean Askew, PhD. My name is Lisa Wickham, Senior Manager of E-Learning Programs here at GCSAA and will serve as today's moderator. A couple quick housekeeping notes before I turn things over to Sean. We are recording today's event. You'll receive access to that recording via follow-up email. Your audio is muted in this system, but we do encourage you to ask questions as you go along. You can do that by clicking on the Go to Webinar Control Panel tab. You'll see there's a little raise hand icon there, or uh, if that icon if that tab is all you see click on that orange rectangle at the top and that will open up the control panel you'll be able to type into the question answer box you'll also see there the handout area where you can download a handout and take notes as we go along today today's session is eligible for gcsa external education points and at the end of the program we'll give you a code that you can use on the association's website to earn those we hope you find today's webinar valuable it's brought to us in partnership with pbi gordon with a full line of herbicides insecticides fungicides growth regulators and other products pbi gordon corporation is a national leader in the professional turf and ornamental management industry Today's presenter is Sean Askew, PhD, uh, originally from Mississippi and earned his bachelor's and master's from Mississippi State University. He received his PhD in weed science at North Carolina State University in 2001 and currently serves as professor of turf grass weed science at Virginia Tech School of Plant and Environmental Sciences. He conducts research, teaches classes, and mentors graduate students at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. He has presented over 1,100 invited talks, lectures, and extension presentations and is also one of the science scientists on the Resist POA research team. Please join me in welcoming today's presenter, Sean Askew, PhD. Take it away, Sean. All right, thanks a lot, Lisa. I see you opted for the long bio there, that's fine. Um, in between. Uh, yeah, that's right, you did trim it a little. All right, so I'm I'm, I'm happy to be here, and thanks to PBI Gordon. Uh, uh, they, they certainly aren't very self-serving with this presentation. I don't have very many of their products in it, uh, but I'm glad that they're able to offer this uh, for you all, and I hope you'll get something meaningful out of it. So this is a this is a seriously huge topic, right? Poa annua, chemical and cultural practices. There were so many things that I wanted to put into this presentation that just did not make it. And so I'm primarily going to be focusing on cool season turf uh, with this presentation, but the cultural things that I'll be talking about are going to be applicable for any type of turf. And by all means, if anyone has questions related to specific products or how any of the products that I'll be talking about today would be used in warm season systems, and including my limited knowledge of ultra dwarf greens, but we are currently, we have active research on, on ultra dwarf Bermuda grass greens, as well as in Bermuda grass fairways. Uh, so there's plenty of things that I could uh, talk about. We just don't have time. So let's get right into it. Pull annual identification. I'm going to breeze through this really quickly. The big things are the membrane ligule, folded vernation, that kind of lime green coloration. Poa triv is the closest thing that you're going to have to distinguish it from. A lot more red and orange coloration on poa triv, triv leaves and stems, especially following winter stress. If you have any type of stressful cold conditions, poa triv is really going to light up with that orange to red coloration. Uh, poa, can, poa annual can do it a little bit, but not quite as much. Poa triv also is a little more stoloniferous than uh, poa annua. Otherwise, the two species are pretty hard to distinguish. And poa triv is going to get a lot more mature a lot quicker in the spring because it's a perennial bouncing back. Now, most of our problems with poa annua, though, are on greens. And in that system, we have both perennial types as well as annual types. And these can be characterized uh, pretty clearly in most cases. Perennial types, less seed heads, finer texture, annual types, the exact opposite. I typically see more annual type on less intensively managed greens and more perennial types on intensively managed greens. Uh, I do not really see a, a north-south association. The more PGR used, the lower the height of cut, et cetera, the more intensive the management leads to more perennial biotypes is what my experience suggests. 
So in order to combat POA, we need to understand POA. And the main thing that you really need to understand is how to assess POA populations because they're always changing. Uh, one of the big problems is they're changing seasonally. So bear in mind that your clientele, the golfers that are using your course, the Greens Committee chair, uh, people that you're gonna be dealing with, they're not necessarily gonna remember the POA problem that you have when it peaks in the spring in a temperate climate they may be thinking more about what it looks like in the summertime. And also they, in seeing these naturally occurs, occurring seasonal shifts in POA annual visibility, a lot of these people assume that when you do things, management inputs, that the shift that occurs following that management is a natural shift. And they don't necessarily attribute it to the activities the superintendent is doing. And even, people who are actually managing the turf. They need to understand how to assess turf cover, and you see a couple examples, five to 20% there. But more importantly, they need to understand how to assess long-term changes in their inputs. So look at the top two squares, the initial on the upper left, and let's just say, let's hypothetically say two years after a very expensive treatment program, it's gonna look like what it does on the right. Your assumption there is that the product has not worked, and there's less than 5% control. But what if you were to go out and put a doormat or a small piece of plywood or some non-treated check plot, every time you sprayed, you protected a small area in uh, for evaluation, and you would maybe know that two years later, it would have looked like the lower left corner. Well, now all of a sudden, the fact that we've merely kept Poanua about where it was becomes a 75% control and you will be very happy with the results of the product. So keep that in mind. Poor annual population is always shifting and you need to have non-treated check plots in place to assess that. Here's an example where a product was applied over here on the left, at, I'm sorry, on the left is untreated. The product was applied on the right side of the green and even on the treated area, they put a doormat uh, as an untreated check plot in that particular area so that you can get a much clearer vision of what's actually happening to the poa annua in these treated areas. Now, problems associated with poa annua, knowing your enemy. All right, in this case, this, this one image I think can tell us everything we need to know. Poa is a very successful invader, but it's very, it's not very good at uh, persisting in the long haul. And this example shows that pretty well. The large rec or L-shaped uh, uh, rectangular block that you see in the center of that green. In the previous summer, they had heat stress and they lost a lot of annual bluegrass because of it and they could not find annual bluegrass sod, so they put bent grass sod, which is the only thing they had. What you're looking at now is ice damage that clearly was more impactful to the annual bluegrass than it, than it was to the bent grass. And so is going to be more susceptible to various stressors as well as there's a number of diseases, insect pests, et cetera, that will attack POA first before moving on to bent grass or other cool season grasses. And so it's a challenge to keep POA as a desirable turf. And that's one of the problems associated with this weed. Does POA annua affect playability? I mean, looking at an image like this, you would argue, yeah, but what about a situation where you have maybe one to 2% POA on the green and the ball just encounters a single patch of POA, would that single patch rolling over that patch of POA alter your, um, your ball roll? So we have, uh, we're missing a little bit of our question here, Lisa. The actual question is, assuming a perfect putt will always hold out, will a significant number of balls miss the cup? There we go, thank you. Uh, will a significant number of balls miss the cup if the balls roll over a patch of POA. I'm curious what you, you all would, would think about that. So assuming that if you're on pure bent grass, every ball holds out, will almost all the balls also hold out if it rolls over a patch of POA? Do you think the textural uh, uh, situation there is similar enough or is there a big enough difference? And bear in mind, we're talking about high-end managed greens. So that POA is being mowed just like the bent, et cetera, et cetera but will it alter the playability? So Everyone? while they're uh, voting on this, Sean, there is a question here asking, how do you quantitatively measure POA annua? Well, so I, I showed a couple of placards showing if it looked like this, what the percentage would be. All right, so I, I, I agree, that's pretty shallow. 
uh, what I do is I look at visually look at the plot and I determine what percentage of the plot that I would attribute to POA. And then mentally, I switch over to the bent grass on the green and I ask myself, does that make up the balance or the difference between 100% and like if I told, if I look at that and I say, I think that's 30% POA, can I also make an, a reasonable argument that I'm looking at 70% bent? And I may look at that and say, no, no, there's more than 70% bent there. That's 80% bent. And then I look back at the POA. All right, can I? Yeah, maybe I can bump that down to 20%. And you go back and forth between the two options, which is desirable turf versus POA in this case. And you come up with uh, a, a estimate of the percentage area covered by POA. And that's how we do much of our research. Also, we also do direct measurement and counts and things like that. But a lot of our data is just visually estimating. And once you're pretty well trained to do it, you can do it very accurately. All right, so ready to move on there, Lisa? Okay, yes, 61%, yeah. no, 39%. Um, I would say in some situations, the no's may have it, but I think the folks that responded yes are correct. And let me tell you why I think that. Uh, we've actually done research on this topic at uh, Virginia Tech, and we've published a couple of papers in the journal Crop Science that talks about how poannua can influence ball roll, because a lot of people have said that it would, uh, but no one's ever measured it. And let me tell you, it is extremely, extremely difficult to measure. We employed a number of techniques, including high-speed uh, video cameras and pressure-sensitive paper to mark the I'm not getting an advance. Come on, baby. Let's see. Well, I used the I, I mouse. Think I, lost my, I think I lost my keyboard. So yeah, I, you, after I do the poll, you'll have to click the screen again. All right. There we go. So including high-speed cameras, a mechanical putting robot, and a pressure-sensitive paper to score the uh, where the ball was in mid-roll. You know, we're not waiting for the ball to come to a rest because everyone knows you need to putt past the cup because it gets really squirrely there at the end. And there's a number of physics reasons for that that I don't have time to go into. But we collected a lot of data and what we found, and I think it's uh, it can be summarized best with the images over here. The top image where you see the laser pointer now is when the ball is rolling over pure bent grass, that's 10 balls. And all 10 of them are almost pinging the exact same place. We have a plus or minus about five millimeter deviation from our uh, measured or alignment. When we roll over a patch of POA, we increase that on the average to about 13 millimeters, plus or minus deviation. And if you think about an average golf course cup being four inches wide, if you move about one and a half to one and three quarters to the left or right, you're going to lip out. And if you convert that to millimeters and do the math, it means that on pure bend, if you're perfectly aimed, you're going to hole out on an eight meter putt. Statistically, on the average, you're going to hole out. But if you roll over a patch of POA, one patch of POA, our data suggests that it's gonna reduce that distance to uh, six feet. So eight meters is about 24 feet on bent, six feet on POA. So it's a pretty significant change. And we were not able to measure that change with the greens tester, only when we used our mechanical putter. And there's some other things about sources of error that we had to eliminate in order to get these data that's, uh, a whole journal article if you want to go read it in crop science. We also measured bounce, and this uh, each black dot is the center of a golf ball that was tracked with video tracking software. And this is high speed video, and I think this was a thousand or 1500 frames per second. And you can see that the, the amount of bounce that occurs did increase after encountering the POA patch. And the reason it looks like the ball was going up into the air as it rolled was based on perspective change at the angle in relation to the camera. We subtracted all of that out before we took our statistical analysis in this work. All right, so POA makes things ugly, can affect playability, uh, tends to lead to disease or insect and other pest problems more quickly, and it's hard to control. So let's, let's look at some of the things that we can do to uh, culturally suppress POA is where we're gonna start first. Here's a short list, but I'm gonna talk about each of them individually, so let's move right into it. First one up. Choose appropriate turf grass. Now you all have to worry about the golf play 
and what the architect envisioned for the course and what the players or the greens committee wants for the course. So, and there'll be many other, like you can't control when it rains and when it doesn't. So when I get into talking about moisture, I know that you cannot control every one of these things. You just need to do what you can do. And just, I'm throwing this out here so you all will be reminded of some of these things that you already know and think about them. But number one would be choose appropriate turf grass. Why would we do it? Reduce management inputs and also reduce the amount of POA that's available on one part of the course that can be moved to another part of the course, for example, like on uh, putting greens. And so wherever possible, match your turf type to the climate and consider evaluating play areas and non-play areas and utilizing strategies like non-mow fine fescue to pretty much eliminate POA in that portion of the golf course. And I'll show you some examples of that as we get into it. Everything about cultural management for suppression of POA is about maximizing the competition of your turf grass against the POA. So changing the mowing height to a more desirable height for that type of turf is going to very positively influence its ability to remove POA. Here's just a graphic that's an estimate of the amount of turf competition on a one to 10 scale that you would get from different species uh, at different mowing heights. Red is uh, 0.3 to 0.7 inch and blue is two to four inch. So tall fescue, fine fescue are gonna perform better at tall mowing heights and Kentucky, blue, or Kentucky bluegrass, creeping bent, Bermuda grass, zoysia grass are gonna perform better at uh, low mowing heights on the average. The problem with the warm season turf uh, zoysia and Bermuda is that they have this dormancy period uh, that allows for an explosion of POA and that's why most of the POA product market is in the southern United States and most of the resistance cases are in the southern United States. Here's a great example of how choosing the appropriate turf type can make a huge difference. We're not, I'm not showing you any POA in this picture but I'm showing you voids that will lead to poa on the tall fescue which is on the left that will not lead to poa on that zoysia grass on the right this is in williamsburg virginia here's a great example of where high traffic areas can be managed since they're really out of play in this case coming off the tees can be managed in such a way to prevent poa annua from being deposited on golfer's shoes and then move to the fairways and then move from the fairways to the greens and so on all right, the next cultural practice, keeping the surface dry, prevent poa annua seed from germinating, and you reduce the survival of those tiny little seedlings when the surface is dry. So you're only irrigating when your desirable turf tells you you need to irrigate. And it, the best time to do this is when poa annua is uh, having germination flushes in the fall or in the early spring. And I realize those are also two times of year in temperate climates where we get a lot of rainfall. But to the extent that you're able, try to scrutinize water use when poa annua seedlings are young because it will go a long way to make everything later more uh, effective. Also, improving surface drainage. We do not want green lips. All right, we don't want standing water either on the fairways or the greens. So anything that you can do to improve uh, watershed off the greens to prevent ponding, or to uh, make infiltration or get that water over to the drains on the fairways is going to improve your ability to combat poa annua because it increases the, uh, the healthy or happiness of the turf. Like for example, voids that are like this, which could have been caused by standing water, in uh, this case, Kentucky bluegrass, they will lead to annual bluegrass problems down the road, as you see here. Mowing correctly, All right, for most, in the most case, we, we have the budgets to have decent equipment um, and we have, I hope, good mechanics. We keep everything sharp. One of our problems might be to get our employees to slow down uh, with some of the mowers, but anything that you can do to get a cleaner cut is gonna make a healthier turf, which is gonna be a more competitive turf. Uh, so fall, you know, sharp mower blades, one third rule, Mowing frequency, another one that I would add that's not on the slide would be your mowing pattern, especially on slopes. So we always train our employees to mow perpendicular to a slope for safety reasons, but that doesn't mean they have to be exactly 90 degree perpendicular to that slope and follow the exact same track every time and burn in mower tire tracks on those slopes. If they'll just change that angle by 30 degrees, and you know, mowing up or slightly down the slope as they go instead of straight 90 degrees, it'll make a huge difference 
and preventing that excessive wear that's going to lead to those void areas in the tire tracks that leads to poor annual on that rough, which leads to poor annual seed that you're going to be tracking all over everywhere else. And you just, you don't want this to happen. So either slow down or make sure your equipment's good and sharp because it causes an enormous amount of stress to the turf, which opens the canopy slightly, which leads to the survival of like 3% more poor annual seedlings, which can make a huge difference on your golf course a year from now. Avoiding compaction. And everyone has seen, I'm sure, on your golf courses that POA will um, take advantage of compacted areas. And it's not because POA annual loves compaction, it's because POA annual can thrive better when it doesn't have to compete with other turf and POA does have a shallow root system and so it can it can deal with compaction a little bit better although it succumbs to other stressors because of that shallow root system it's hard to keep alive but anyway anything we can do to deal with compaction is going to give us a more competitive turf and less POA annual you know here's a, a great example when you're if you're using riding mowers on greens for budgetary reasons and you know the g-forces that are caused by mowing a little bit too fast on those turns you're pushing the reels into the turf you're you're accentuating differences between tire pressure and reels such that you get those tire tracks and those are areas that are going to experience more stress and they're areas that'll have a more seasonal fluctuation of poa annua and anything we can do to avoid that all the better and i can tell you in the transition zone here in virginia collar management it's a huge huge problem they get beat down they get diseased they get infested with all types of weeds and we've got folks using turning mats and doing everything that they can to to try to reduce stress on the collar um you almost to no avail because it's an extremely difficult task here in the transition zone you also have different soil types from the greens construction that overlap in the collar making management more difficult all right, moving on to poor annual control. We're going to start out with seed seed head suppression, and then we're going to move into a little bit about PGRs and then to a selected group of herbicides that I'm going to talk about, mainly for post-emergence control of poa and cool season turf, because it's just all the time we have for 45 minutes. And we do have another participant poll. If you could hook me up on that, Lisa, thanks. How aggressively do you target annual bluegrass in managed turf? Uh, select one. I routinely use PGRs, but seldom herbicides. I routinely use herbicides, but seldom PGRs. I use them both routinely. Or POA is not that big of a problem for me. I may use a product occasionally, but not routinely. All right, Lisa, let's keep it going. It's hard to wait with that silence, isn't it? Yes, it is. But, I see, and I can say. see the votes are still coming in. So, okay. uh, yeah, right, I know so it, it's tough. Closing the poll now. We want the votes to come in so we can display the uh, the vote count. Yeah, in five, four, That's three, two. Okay, PGRs routinely use both so both or pgrs would be uh the deal there and and especially if you're talking about greens i can understand that because hesitancy to use a herbicide on greens is probably a wise thing all right so moving into um seed ed suppression there has been an improvement in seed ed suppression technology in the last several years uh, a lot of the original work for that was done here at Tech, but it basically, I struggled for many, many years to try to figure out how to get better performance in the spring of products like Ethafon for seed head suppression, and I failed for many, many years. And my observations led me to believe that randomly during the winter, during warm days, we must have a certain number of poannual plants that are hormonally making this, this decision to make a seed head even if they physically can't do it because of the cold weather. So if you get a couple of warm days, are those poor plants being triggered to make seed heads, but the progress of the tissue development is so slow, we don't see them until we actually warm up the following spring. Since ethafon changes hormone balances 
uh, through ethylene escalation in the plant, it is sending a signal to the plants to not make a seed head, make a leaf instead. Well, if the plants already made that decision back in the winter, how is a spring application of ethophon going to help me? Well, it, it doesn't in years where those decisions are made in mass. So I decided let's apply the product earlier in the winter. Let's apply it earlier in the fall. And, and sure enough, it worked really well. The green line indicates poannual populations when you use a early application followed by a normal spring program. Red is ethophon programs that are applied spring only. Black is uh, the non-treated check, the amount of poa seed heads you would have uh, in that plot. And that is a typical scenario that I've seen play out over and over. And I'll show you, I forgot again, Lisa, I've got to uh, get my mouse back on here to get it to advance. There we go. So I'll show you a couple of pictorial examples. Here is uh, proxy spring only up here and up down here infested with seed heads. And then we have with a January early app, a February early app, or a March. And the March, can't quite tell it in this image, but the March was not as good a performer because it was too close to the spring program. Here's some better images. Non-treated check full of seed heads. This is proxy with the early app plus a spring program. And this is proxy with only the spring program. And this is a more striking comparison between with and without the early application for seed head suppression. Some combinations, this is a fall followed by spring uh, program, a total of three applications typically in these cases. I'll go through the rates in just a second. But Signature Extra in the tank with proxy, Fiata in the tank with proxy, Primo in the tank with proxy, um, and they all look outstanding. But when we only do proxy just in the spring, or if we only do proxy Primo just in the spring, the performance is not quite as good. You can see Proxy Primo with the early app here, and you can compare it to Proxy Primo without the early app here. Civitas did not change what Ethophon was doing for seed head suppression in our trials, although it did make winter color much better with that pigment. Our recommendation right now is um, Proxy alone, or you can, as you saw, you can put other things in the tank depending on your needs on the putting green, but your early application is gonna go out between November 15th and February 15th, at least in our area in Virginia. So it's a pretty wide window. And then uh, at five ounce per thousand, and then you follow up with a growing degree daytime spring program. We typically trigger those in our area at 400 to 450 base 32 growing degree days if you're starting to count growing degree days on February 1st. And then we'll follow up with three to four weeks later to extend that spring season with another application. Some folks that experience longer POA seed production season in the spring like to move to a two ounce and they go bi-weekly as long as they need in the season. And sometimes in Virginia, we may need to do a two ounce kicker to extend us out to the rest of the season. But what I would warn against is applying too much proxy near the end of the spring season so that a lot of it's still hanging around when it gets hot that can cause crown rising and associated scalping. All right, moving straight on to plant growth regulators um, for POA, we're talking more suppression control now, not seed head suppression, but actually trying to kill or phase out the POA. And here's my quote for you to walk away. You can dis disagree with me if you want, that's fine. Uh, many people do successfully, I might add, but I would argue that you can be lean and mean on your greens, low nitrogen, altering pH to favor the bent over POA, um, you know, really trying to uh, be aggressive in your thatch management by manipulating nitrogen content to really low levels uh, per year. You can do that, or you can use plant growth regulators like Trimit and Cutlass, but you should not be doing both. You should not have both of those philosophies on your course at the same time, because I would argue you're not gonna be as successful at, at dealing with the POA, and you're making life way more difficult on you in dealing with the bent, okay? So those that I've seen be most successful at using things like Trimit and Cutlass to phase out POA, they were maximizing nitrogen inputs and PGR inputs in tandem with one another by manipulating clipping yields. So you, you put a mark on a bucket, you measure three passes or four passes on a green, 
You look at the clipping yield from that, if it's below what you expect, you increase the nitrogen rate on the next nitrogen application. If you're on a bi-weekly interval for nitrogen and alternately with PGR, when you measure your clipping yield and you find it to be above what you expected, then you up the PGR rate on your next application. And if it's within the expected window, you keep your rates and frequencies the same. And in, in so doing, you're gonna maximize turf competition and also maximize the aggressiveness of the POA suppression that you get from a product like Trimit. That's where I've seen those programs be most successful. And rates, you notice I didn't put rates. If I get 20 superintendents in a room and I ask what's your Trimit rate, I get 20 different answers. So rates are gonna be dependent on your course and your situation. With products like Trimit, the hotter it gets, the lower the rate needs to be to be able to manage the response you're gonna get. With a product like Primo, which I'm talking about in this slide, it's somewhat different. We've learned recently, or when I say recently, remember, I'm so old and see now, recently means one decade increments, okay? So in the last 10 years, we've really shifted toward growing degree day-based application timings of Primo because the product is metabolized more rapidly in hot weather. So a 200 growing degree day timing is what they're recommending. But I took weather data for 60 years and I created a model in, in Excel and I asked the question, on, on this day of the year, out of any of these 60 years, on this day of the year, if I apply Primo, how long would I have had to wait in 1952 on January 8th before I got 200 growing degree days and needed to apply again? And you notice in some cases, if you're like in early part of the year, it could be 100 days or more. But what amazed me is, the growing degree day stuff works great, but we only need it on the tail ends. In the spring when it's really cool and in the fall when it's cool, we need to trigger our applications based on growing degree days. In the summer, everything for 60 years just flattened out and it stayed about seven to 10 days regardless. So I found that very interesting in terms of application reinterval for uh, Primo. But back to suppressing pole with things like trim it, this is what you're trying to do. The POA sinks down below the canopy, and you're trying to get the bent grass to grow over the top of the POA and outcompete it. So it requires the PGR aggressiveness and the turf competition aggressiveness to be successful. Otherwise, when you stop spraying and walk away, it all jumps right back. Are generics as good as proprietary products? All of our research says yes. From a performance standpoint, they're just as good. One thing that I would warn you about is if you are using generics, you are going to have to be a lot more cautious about accidentally mismatching jugs. A lot of the generic companies are putting the exact same jug, exact same label, same font size, same green font for an insecticide and for a very injurious herbicide. And if you grab that exact same jug with the same looking text and pour that herbicide in the tank with your annual bluegrass weevil product, you're gonna kill your greens. And so, you know, that kind of thing doesn't happen with proprietary companies because they've got a different color jug, or at least they used to. I think a lot of that's, it seems like um, the, the amount of different odd shaped jugs and different color jugs that we used to see may be going away somewhat, but that is a great strategy to help prevent missprays on the course. But no, we don't see a difference between how a proprietary cutlass will perform versus a generic. Here's some examples of PGR effects coming out of the late AGA Powell's program at University of K Kentucky. This is the non-treated check at about 20%. Cutlass doing a great job. Trimit doing a great job. But again, this is eight applications for one year is what they did. And they're looking at it right after they stopped spraying. And I will guarantee you, you turn your back on that for about a month and most of that POA will return. But here's Primo. We don't, I'm throwing this out there just to say, we don't expect Primo to suppress POA to a level that we can actually phase it out or kill it. It's just helping you maintain a little bit better quality on the green, better putting quality and better visual. All right, moving off of PGRs, I know this is pretty fast paced, I apologize, but moving right into herbicides, I've got these four products that I'm gonna talk about because I think each of them have something to offer that you could utilize in cool season turf. But first, let's talk a little bit about using herbicides on greens. It's kind of a difficult thing to do. By nature, greens are more sensitive to herbicides than other areas of the course. And we often get injury. This is uh, Anderson's Crab and Goose on a bent grass green. You got a line there. You got a line way over here on the left. 
You got a line over here on the right, that's the overlap from the spreader. So how do you avoid this? Probably mix or calibrate for a one third rate, spread the product in three different directions on the green to get your one X rate. Here's another example out of Mississippi State showing the same thing, Anderson's Crab and Goose. This time, in this case, it's on an ultra dwarf green, severe injury, uh, probably from a little bit excessive rate accidentally of the product. Here we're looking at SureGuard or Flumi Oxygen. In this case, it's drift and lateral movement of water across the green that caused uh, phytotoxicity to the green from that product. And everyone knows that Curve is a highly mobile product. In this case, it was sprayed right up to the edge of the green up here, and it's going right toward the cup back here. Um, horrible injury. We don't want to be in that situation. And Poa annua, when I, it, as I move into our topic of herbicides, I want to mention that Poa annua, among its weed cohorts, is one of the best, or we might call it worst, at developing resistance to various herbicide modes of action. And the SCRI team has uh, screened 1,400 populations, and this is the spread of where red is resistant and blue is, was found to be susceptible. And notice that two things, resistance is a big problem, maybe bigger than you thought it might've been. And two, resistance is mostly in the transition zone and further south. I think mainly because in the north, we don't really have a lot of products that we can use to target poa annua. And most of the products that were screened in this study aren't uh, usable on cool season turf to any great extent. First up, amicarbazone. Now this is a triazine, so it will, uh, Speaking of resistance, it will not work on triazine resistant POA, which was one of the biggest types of resistance that we found across um, the southern half of the country. But on plants that aren't triazine resistant, for example, in the north on cool season turf, it's going to work pretty well. It's all about balancing speed of control of POA and phyto to your desirable bent grass. Here we're looking at rates two and a half. As we get up to four and five, you start to see phyto on the bent. Luckily, we can control POA at rates at three down to one ounce, depending on your program and how many applications. You can see four applications here, two applications at two ounce, two at three. Typically, it's recommended that you use these higher rates when you're dealing with really cold weather. So if it's closer to 50 degrees, you're going two or three ounce. If it's closer to 80 degrees, you're going one ounce. This temperature can have a huge influence on how this product works. Here's a situation in Richmond, Virginia, where the product was used on greens because that's what was recommended when, when this product was first being experimentally evaluated. And um, it waylaid this green. We're looking at this green two months after the damage. And so even in two months of recovery, it still looks like this. And they found out during that episode that uh, 50 to 80 degrees was the sweet spot. If you get above 80, you're gonna have severe injury to bent grass. So I went back to my weather data and I made another model. This time I asked what number of the past 60 years would maximum temperatures be between 50 and 80 degrees for one week following a given spring day, in this case in Richmond, Virginia. So I'm asking if my, I'm not saying your criteria has to be this to spray exonerate. I'm just saying if my criteria was that my max temp had to be between 50 and 80 for a week after application, how many years would I have hit that mark and what part of the year would I have hit it? And in Richmond, it's gonna be around April, early to mid-April, about out of 60 years, we're just under half of the time we can meet that criteria. In Blacksburg, Virginia, it's early May. And again, it's about half the time out of 60 years we can meet the criteria that I suggested there. Key strategies for exonerate, great to clean up cool season roughs, great spring curative approach, um, especially in roughs like tall fescue roughs. Avoid use on greens, avoid fairways that are experiencing any type of environmental stress and spray when temps, prevailing temps are between 50 and 80. Prograss is another, in my opinion, underutilized product, especially in the North. And one of the things that I think we failed really to do with this product is to, to look at its uses in, in roughs, as, especially with, with relation to um, seeding of cool season roughs like tall fescue. So in my opinion, Progress is a great product for establishment of Kentucky bluegrass and 
uh, tall fescue in the fall. You'll use lower rates uh, than typical on Kentucky Blue, but you can go uh, for tall fescue, you can go right up to you know a half gallon or even more. You can go up to a gallon if you want, but you don't need it. Um, but in Kentucky Blue, I would go with a quarter to one third gallon of the old EC product at establishment. And then another application, what you're trying to do in all cases is to uh, apply multiple laps in cool season turf, and you're trying to catch the poa soon after it emerges. And then the second application in the fall would be about a month later so that you can extend your suppression of POA through that longer fall season. And in the cool season world, we follow up with a third spring app soon after the spring flush of POA. It's all about catching the POA plants when they're young so that subsequent leaves will not have cuticles and it's gonna leave them exposed to a harsh winter condition. And if we get those winter conditions, we can kill a lot of the POA with this product. All right, tenacity. The reason I've got it in here is it's also great for fall establishment of desirable cool season turf, not bent grass. Um, you can apply tenacity at low rates, two to four ounces. I'll, I like to go two or three, and then you apply three or four times at two week intervals. And if you'll do that starting when you seed, and then every two weeks after that for about a you know a month and a half or so, uh, you're going to keep poa annua from coming into especially kentucky bluegrass stands it's an excellent way to keep poa out of that uh, but also tall fescue perennial rye it's a great approach to keeping your roughs or even fairways clean during establishment here's an example at virginia tech this was an intep that we sprayed for them using this program and this is the overlap into a tall fescue area that was just seeded in the border so all this was fall established we came in at seeding and sprayed the first app, and then we stayed on, I think we only applied three times, three bi-weekly applications at about three ounce, and it did a great job to keep the POA out. All right, moving on to POA cure. Um, and I'm gonna spend a little more time on this product. I wish I had more time for all of this stuff, but we, we just don't. This is uh, the first whole green that was ever treated in the United States with this product back in 2009, Harrisonburg, Virginia. They put a four by four sheet of plywood down and then they sprayed the, sprayed the entire green. They applied three times and every time they applied, they put the plywood back on the exact same spot. And, and it did a phenomenal job. It blew us away back before anybody knew anything about Polar Cure. And, and the, the maintenance crew knew I was coming to evaluate my plots this spring when I took this image and they put the cup dead center as a joke, dead center of that check plot. And but it's been uh, it's been a great, albeit too long road to finally get this product to uh, registration uh, between the research that I've done and all of my colleagues around the southeast. Uh, but this product works. Here's an example out of California. Uh, but it can cause injury. Our biggest issue with pole cure is managing the speed at which we lose the pole. And that can get enough complaints. What's way more rare is getting injury to bent. And in my opinion, it's extremely easy to avoid this. You have to have two environmental stressors plus crazy high rates to get it. That's the only time I've ever seen it. And I've done a lot of things to try to make this product harm bent. But I'm showing you one of them. This is at Hanover Country Club where they had record heat and they aerified two days after we sprayed. And at the 2X, 3X and 4X rates, we had pretty serious troubling bent grass phytotoxicity even a little bit of thinning at the forex rate but when we came back a month later this is the same trial but this is not polycure this is another product chameleon which is also currently under evaluation for registration in the u.s to do something similar to what polycure does uh, control poets it's registered in japan the polycure plots that you just saw are all out here but they are no longer causing any visible phyto. Notice we, outside of the trial, we are getting environmental stress that's causing the loss of bent grass. This is a very stressful, hot summer in Richmond. It was a record, I don't know, I can't tell you how many year record, but it was a record heat summer. And they literally failed to keep these chameleon plots alive, but they did not have that problem with the poa cure. So it was that initial airification event plus the hot weather that led to the phyto from the poa cure. But after that, they were fine. And Poa Cure also controls Poa Trivialis. This is in a perennial ryegrass lawn in Blacksburg, Virginia. Here's the Poa Cure. In this case, really, really high rates compared. This would be 8X compared to what we're doing on greens. And this is uh, Velocity, which was also at that time the standard for Poa Triv control. And Velocity, as long as you've got hot weather, it'll hasten the dormancy of Poa Triv moving into the summer. 
But in our research, what comes back the following fall is really close in population density to what you originally had. So it's um, it takes uh, more than just the application to phase out poor trib with products like that. Here's another example published in the journal Weed Technology, looking at long-term effects of poa cure on poa triv in, in at play golf courses, uh, a couple of golf courses in Virginia where we did this work. And some other examples of its use by my colleagues. This is in Northern California, uh, pretty serious. You know, if you get too fast and too aggressive, in this case, those rates are way more than what's typically recommended you can have compromised putting conditions for about three weeks with this product. Um, usually, I, I always say when these things have happened where I've seen it, by the time uh, the haters get their troops assembled, the greens look so good that the problem just goes away for the superintendent. That's generally what I've seen. But be forewarned that if, if you just can't stand the slow approach that they're recommending and want to get more aggressive, and even if you're doing everything you're supposed to do, it, if you've got a lot of POA, it could look like this. And so that needs to be educated up front to all of your membership before moving in, especially at high POA densities, because we don't want to see this type of compromised putting surface. Here's some work out of Alabama back in the day, Dr. Harold Walker. This is all the way back to 2011. Excellent programs here that, uh, that he was evaluating very, various rates. Of POA cure. MRC01 was the experimental code for the product. Here's a couple of examples of just two apps, November and January, at two rates. Non treated amicarbazone or exonerate, also two apps, uh, December, January in that case, and a little bit higher rates of uh, POA cure doing a great job there. And here's POA cure with amicarbazone or amicarbazone with Trimit. And you know, the POA cures, I'm sorry, that was POA cure alone compared to AMI with Trimit. Here's some work out of Georgia, Dr. Patrick McCullough, also excellent results on POA control there. Dr. Jim Brosnan, University of Tennessee, same thing. So um, it can get you there. The question is, how tortuous is the path? How much POA do you have? How bad are things going to look in the interim? And that's what we're trying to balance with this product. Cool thing about the label, no signal word. So it is below caution and toxicity. It did not even require a signal word from the EPA. I don't think I've ever seen a herbicide marketed in the turf arena that could say that. Uh, lowest PPE requirement possible, no setbacks from water. When they had the EUP, the, the EPA put a lot of restrictions on water, but it was because there were certain data that they didn't have. Now that they have the data, you can spray an island green. As long as you do not spray directly onto the water, you're fine. All right, we have a participant poll. We do, and while I am putting this poll up, I want to say my famous line, which is the label is the law. We want to make sure that people know what the label is, where they're located, and they follow those label rules. Sometimes researchers can do things that are not exactly on the label. And so we always want to mention, know what the label says, where you're located. Absolutely true. And um, it's, you know, we run into that all the time. One of the most common ones I encounter is uh, the, the, the weed that I want to target is not on the label. All right, this is a kind of a gray area here. Now it is legal. Let's say for example, you had Polynesian grass weed. Okay, I made that up. So Polynesian like grass weed is over here, and it's not Polynesian grass weed is not on the label. But I also have crabgrass in this area. If you use a crabgrass product for crabgrass control, and it also kills Polynesian grass weed, that's legal. But if an inspector comes out to your site and you say I'm spraying this Polynesian grass weed with a claim extra, then you're going to get a fine. In that case, it's all about what you said. If you come, if they walked up and you said, I'm spraying this crabgrass right here, you're good. But if you pointed at that, even though there's crabgrass in the area, if you pointed at that Polynesian grass weed and said, I'm spraying that, you'll get a fine. So just bear in mind that um, if there is a strategy where there's multiple pests and the control of one pest can also pick up another, and you see that in the research that that's possible, that's a legal avenue to get something out. But if you are only targeting Polynesian grassweed 
and that's the honest to God's truth, then you can't use a claim extra or any selective herbicide. You would have to go to a non-selective spot spray with something like Roundup that says, and I'll quote the label, controls grassy weeds. All right, boom, you're in like Flynn because it's a non-selective. It's expected to control any grassy vegetation in this case that it's applied on. Okay, so I didn't even call out the question, but I'm hoping you all are, you, okay, you got it all banged out. I spot spray, I spot spray and use dabbers, 21%, cool. Uh, no, I only broadcast 14%. All right, great. In my last six slides, we're running out of time. I've got a really, really cool subject to, um, to follow up with, and that I think is very applicable to POA, and also very applicable to a product that's extremely expensive like Polacure, and that is targeted application technologies. And this is a, a technique that has never gotten any scientific scrutiny that we can find in the literature, okay? No one's really done a deep dive on how to use these things for selective products. And the manufacturers just say, hey, put 3% glyphosate in there and go kill everything. You can't get more dead than dead, right? So they don't really care what the product is applying. They, they don't know what the product is applying in application volume per unit area. The premise is that these non-selectives you see here, they can have really long recovery times, right? Because they, they, they're systemic and they move to other areas you don't want them to move to and kill things. Why don't we use a selective herbicide in a spot treatment technology or a dab or something along that line? And so that's what I'm talking about here. All right. So release the interns, right? So labor is obviously, anytime you're talking about this topic, labor is an issue, but with a high priced product like Poacure, there's plenty of meat on the bone. In fact, we've math, we've, we have mathematically calculated it on greens to be about 7%. You can be up to 7% infested and, and handle those with spot treatment or dabbing and still be economically effective, even considering the labor cost. I would warn them with Poacure though, dabbing should be a supplement to the broadcast program because for every plant you see, I guarantee you there's a hundred plants out there waiting to germinate and you will not address those with dabbing. Is this Roundup? No, this is Poacure, all right? And this is a classic scenario where the superintendent took a 1X rate based on one gallon per thousand and told the interns to go out and dab it. Why did Poacure, which I just, I, I'm telling you, I've used this product at 8X, I've used it at 4X, I've used it at 2X, and as long as you don't have other environmental conditions going on, it's you're not gonna hurt bent grass. So what rate did they use to get that effect with Poacure? Well, now that I've got a student working on this, we can tell you. Uh, these are the different devices that my student John Peppers is working on. And let me show you a little bit of data here. So this is several of those dabbers, Weed One Magic, uh, Weed Saver, et cetera, et cetera. These are the application volumes in gallons per thousand. And let me throw this out, on the average, all right, bear with me. I'm gonna show you something in a minute that's gonna blow your mind. This is on the average. So the Weed One Magic is putting out about 17 gallons per thousand. So if you put Polacure at a rate that's based on your Multipro at one gallon per thousand, you're putting a 17X rate out with your dabber on the average. All right, now look at this data. This is also the Weed One Magic. The amount you apply depends on the amount of fluid in that device. When the device is 100% full, which is over here on the left, that mug is putting out 32 gallons per thousand. And when it goes all the way down to about 20% full, it's only putting out about 10 gallons per thousand. So we end up having a 480% decrease in output depending on the amount of fluid in the, the container. And if you think about it, it's because there's more gravitational force pushing down when the container is full than when it's empty. So every time you press to release that valve, more will squirt out when the container's full, less will squirt out when the container is empty. So that's my final slide. I just wanted to let you all know, if I were going to use a dabber, I would, I would estimate 10 gallons per thousand. That should get you in the kind of middle of what you would be dealing with. And so you would be one-tenth of the rate you would normally use, for example, of Polacure, if you want to go out and dab. So, uh, and we're, we're, we're going a lot further than this and we'll have a lot more finished research to offer in the near future, but I felt it appropriate to plug that in. 
And so that is my presentation, Lisa. And I, I think I cut us a little short on question time, but hopefully I can get to, to some questions with the time we have left. Absolutely, Sean. Thanks. Lots of info. That was kind of a whirlwind. Uh, knew it was going to be. If you have questions, raise your hand or type those in the question answer box. Um, you can see on the screen the code that you're going to want to use for education points. You're going to go to the GCSA website and you're going to put in 999-24240-32081. And if you're listening to this in the future, put in the date that you're listening, not our original presentation date. Um, so that's the code that you're going to use for those education points. Um, not seeing questions here yet. I put everyone to sleep. I don't think so. I think they're they're shocked. When using pole cure, do you recommend verticutting the bent to help it to cover back? All right, that's a good question. We have actually tested that and um, we did not see a difference from verticutting. We did see an improvement with, so what we did to do our research, we kept, we set all the greens to what the average NPK use for our area was. We polled six superintendents and we asked all six of them. So we asked them, what is your normal program? So we set our greens fertility program up to that. And we asked all six of them, if you had a catastrophe that caused 30 plus percent loss of turf, what would you do fertility wise to respond? And we took the average of those responses. And what we did is we used NP and K from uh, fluorotene biostimulants, and we used NP and K from regular available like uh, distributor supplied. I think the product name was Bulldog. And what we found was that uh, by adding additional nitrogen, we did substantially improved recovery time. I think it was like two, two and a half weeks improvement. By, by adding the biostimulant to supply our stuff, and it was a massive cocktail that was come up with by Florentine. We did have a, stati a statistically significant improvement in recovery time. It was on the order of a week or less. But I, in my opinion, I don't think it was biologically relevant. Although I would argue if we continue to collect data longer in the season, et cetera, or perhaps if we were already on the floor team program coming into the catastrophic loss of turf, maybe the, the things would have been a, a little bit different. But anyway, point is there was an improvement with floor team, not quite that big, huge improvement with using additional nitrogen. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you exactly how much that would be uh, without going back and looking at our work. Uh, but I did not see a change with verticutting or no. We also looked at Primo and the use of Primo also did not, if you stayed on a Primo program through the recovery, we did not see a change in the rate of recovery. And so uh, use of Primo did not inhibit the lateral recovery, statistically anyway. Okay, does Primo stimulate POA in a bank grass sword? Does it stimulate POA? No, I would, I like in the regulation of POA to be really similar to the regulation of bent with Primo. One of the benefits of using Primo on a mixed stand is that the, the Primo will regulate both color and texture of the two to be more even. Normally POA would grow faster than the bent and the Primo drops the POA down so that between mowings, we don't get quite so shaggy. Um, Primo will possibly lead, it depends on your other management strategies, but Primo could possibly lead to population expansion of POA over time because it is softening the impact of stressors on the POA, just like it does for the bent, uh, especially if you incorporated ethophon for seed head suppression, because that takes away all the energy that's going to be depleted to make the seed heads. So the poor plant has all that energy to combat stress later on if it didn't make a billion seed heads. And so Proxy Plus Primo, keeping everything look, looking good is actually not helping. It's probably increasing the expansion rate of your POA over time. So it's kind of like a catch 22. I need my greens to be playable when all the revenue is being generated in early spring, 
but the chemicals that I put out to do that are not helping me combat my POA problem, which is ever expanding year after year. Okay. Other questions, please type those in or raise your hand. The golf course environmental profile study is going on right now. It's a third series. Uh, would take you about 20 minutes if you have all your records together. Um, really does help us in the industry when we go to uh, government affairs team, talks to leaders in, in the public political arena to help us keep products in use and you can earn uh, points as well for doing that. I'm going to go ahead and uh, and you'll see that on the website if you go there. I'm going to go ahead and put that code 999-24240-32081. What's the best way to maximize bent grass in a mixed POA Kentucky bluegrass sword with no herbicides. All right, did you say the best way to maximize bent in a sword that has Kentucky blue, POA, and bent? Is that correct? Yep, creeping bent. All right. Um, well, so one of the things that Dr. Goatley at Virginia Tech is currently looking at for low budget golf courses is incorporating bent grass seed uh, along with ryegrass seed into mixed sword stands, which also in our case have Kentucky blue. And he is seeing, you know, really good this 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 concept of if you can't beat it, join it, of embracing a mixed sword is actually giving really good overall turf on fairways, overall turf quality. You know that's better at least it doesn't have fluctuation the, you know bare grounds what the golfer is going to complain about and if you can maintain that continuity um, they don't so much mind the patchiness but to maximize bent uh, the products that would be involved there you would want to avoid hppd inhibitors like tenacity and pilex because they're going to suppress the bent and and favor the poa and the uh, kentucky blue and you would choose um let me think about this see met sulfuron would uh can be used in benton kentucky blue and would suppress poa a little bit pgrs would be another way let's see um cutlass is going to be softer on well, i guess it's going to be about the same on all three of them a new is going to be it's going to regulate the Kentucky Blue, and it'll also regulate Bermuda more, no less. It'll regulate Kentucky Blue more than it will bent. Um, I would have to look that up and try to, but, but I do think that there are plant growth regulator ways that you can manipulate suppression of, of those three species. Herbicide wise, a claim would be the opposite of what you need. Quinclorac would be the opposite of what you need. This is a really good question. <laughs> this, uh, so let's see. Well, it seems like looking into some of uh, Dr. Goatley's work on mixed stands might be. Yeah, you know, throwing yeah. in seed, uh, looking at strategies that would utilize seasonal seeding to, to work with the mixed stand seems to be a new topic of research that what I've seen preliminary is showing promise to it just on a low budget course, it's improving the overall quality of the fairways because we just stopped trying to maintain a monoculture, which is so expensive to do. Um, but when I start, I'm trying to think of herbicide or PGR methods to do, and everything that pops in my head does the opposite. It will suppress bent. <laughs> and uh, so the there's another question here about mixed stand, Sean, that, um, he has a, his collars are a mix of POA, Bent, and Lomo Blue. They're thinking about changing to Zoysia and only having the greens be cool season in the future because of POA infestation. Would the POA cure have any control on the Kentucky bluegrass? No, but it will, you know, POA cure would allow you to take the POA annual out and keep it out, but no, it will not 
remove the Kentucky blue at all. So, um, and being able to remove Kentucky blue from bent, I'm really annoyed that something hasn't popped into my head yet. Um, most Don't of the be annoyed. Yeah. At the Fumas Sade, it's going to be very comparable in, in response, bent to Kentucky blue. They're both similar. Um, Met Sulfuron, unfortunately, they're similar. Uh, some of the sulfonyl ureas that we would be getting off label, so I might not, I might as well not even go there. Um, but there are some of them that might could do this, and I know of some experimental products that I've evaluated that could do this like that. But they, to my knowledge, they're not even registered yet in the United States. But I have evaluated experimental products that would take um, that could do that would leave the bent and and remove the other two. But no, and it's probably something so simple that I'm not thinking about, but I will have to uh, email me and I will email and say, hey, I'm the one that asked about X, Y, Z. I'll, I'll see what I can remember or look up and, and get you an answer because that's an intriguing question at trying to suppress. I mean, POA cure can take out the POA, but it will not touch the Kentucky Blue. So you're going to have to either dab it out or regrass the system and then get on on a system that allows you to stay clean. Uh, it can also be used on the zoysia and there's other products that can be used on the zoysia to keep that collar area clean but with many of the zoysia specific products you would have to shield the green very very carefully and you'd also have to worry about tracking and and watershed. With Polacure you wouldn't have those problems. We also okay. have a couple of experimental products that we're working on for POA to try to expand uses in the ultra dwarf greens market um, and other like in the dormant because we're losing glyphosate on dormant sprays in warm season. Well, we're not, I say losing. Glyphosate is under attack and, and the price has exploded for a number of unrelated reasons. And it's just really annoying the number of people that either can't get it or they're, cost, they're priced out of it now or they're being told they can't use it. And so we're looking for alternatives and we've got work that we're doing with endothol, which is an aquatic herbicide. And we also have old work that I'm digging back up with primisulfuron, which is a corn herbicide uh, to try to try to get us more options because either resistance or other factors are taking a lot of the options we have off the table. We're even looking at organic approaches like a blowtorch. <laughs> I hate it, weeds that much. I, 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 yeah, I, I can't wait for that one. I, I'm ready for that now one. in some of my research. So, um, Leva, you have your hand up, and I've unmuted you. I don't know you're muted. Uh, if you want to uh, unmute your microphone and ask a question, you're welcome to do so. Okay, sorry. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. We can now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I work at a uh, private country club in uh, Southern Indiana. And we have zoysia fairways, zoysia surrounds on our uh, on the front nine and uh, cool season mix on the back. Um, these are push-up greens. They're probably 60 years old. Um, I've when we first started working here, this was about 11 years ago. Um, I'd say we were probably 60-40 bent poa ratio. Um, I'd like to say we're 80-20, but we're probably getting a little closer to 70-30 and um with pgr's core verification other agronomic practices i think we've made tremendous strides in reducing the amount of poa we have on the greens um i do uh, i did actually get some poa here but i sure don't feel ready to spray that on the greens um we went from primo to legacy over the last few years and i feel like that's been a big help to us um because honestly, with our zoysia grass being right up to the green's edge on the front, the front nine, um, that primo would really ding the first foot of zoysia grass. And I'm not seeing that with the legacy one bit. And that's a big reason why we switch. And I also think I'm getting better control of the annual bluegrass on the putting surface. Um, my main question is, it's been talked about possibly rebuilding these greens, and I think I heard you mention it earlier, Doc, that if you were possibly to reseed them from the beginning and then use POA cure as something you would do after establishment of a new surface. So, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 
it's a great way to, you know, once you, because one thing that Polar Cure can't do for anyone, it can't put a newer improved variety on that green and it can't get rid of patchy uh, conglomerations of 60 years of old varieties that tend to segregate out. And uh, so you're on those older greens, once you clean the pole up, they're still gonna have segregates of bent that are not gonna be as uniform as a, um, a newer variety. And so those are reasons that the course might consider the expense of renovating. And once you do renovate, yes, uh, pole cure is a great way to, if you, if you keep everything clean coming in and depending on how clean the sod is, um, you could probably, the, comp the company currently is recommending that people initiate with at least one year of the full renovation program to make sure that whatever existing pole that's out there is eliminated uh, because they don't want people to jump on the maintenance program and then blame failure of activity on the product when really there was probably plants that you couldn't see already out there and that's the reason but anyway the maintenance program of this product is like well it's one third of the cost of the renovation program and it and it comes it weighs in at about for a whole course it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of around two thousand dollars for the year so it'd be similar to or maybe a little less than a pgr budget for the year and so yes you could if you went through one year of a, of a renovation program to the tune of about six to eight grand for the whole course and then got on about a two thousand a year maintenance program the data suggests you will keep those greens clean and what we're trying to do is develop dabbing solutions so that you know i, I would rather if i had a product that was safe and didn't cause burn marks on the green I would rather dab than bend over with a pocket knife. But Pole Cure on a maintenance program is guaranteed to keep your uh, pocket knife work to a manageable level. But I would rather have dabbing solutions because this product is very lenient. We can go four or five X uh, with dabbers accidentally and it's not gonna cause injury. It was only when we discovered that folks are going up to 32 X that we realized why they were seeing a lot of burn with the product. Yeah, that that whole use of those uh, dabbers, as you call them, <laughs> it, it needs to be dialed in a little bit more there, doesn't it? And the example we gave actually was the number one ranked dabber from superintendents on Twitter. So my student reached out and did a little poll and he had, I want to say he had like 38 or 42 respondents uh, nationwide and over half of them said that they used that weed wand magic. and and that one was the example that I gave where you can see with those dabbers, the fuller it is, the more it's putting out. And we also, we're doing some other work. We don't believe that the entire surface of the dabber is applying the same rate across the entire surface. When you squish that foam, you're squeezing all the product out to the outside and then it washes down the side. And I'm afraid we might be getting 50X on the perimeter and 10X in the center, um, but we haven't proved that yet. Yeah, and I see what you mean. Really that accuracy crazy, isn't quite uniform. We've got some really crazy labor-intensive ways that uh, I can make students collect that data. We're actually going to take coffee straws and dab on a bundle of coffee straws, and then they have to separate the bundle of coffee straws and weigh every one of them to find out how much water is in it. So then Has we can, the word uh, gotten around, <laughs> Professor Askew, about <laughs> what it's like to be an intern there? I don't know. <laughs> hey, you will not do the same thing twice, two days in a row. I can tell you that. That's that's how well, my that's program. Fun. Is. <laughs> um, we we do appreciate you teaching for us today and sharing some of those new approaches with us. I uh, want to thank PBI Gordon also for um, putting this on the calendar today. Everybody for joining us. Um, seeing no further questions there. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Appreciate y'all. Thanks a lot. You want me to stay on, Lisa? Or You're you good, done? sir. Thank you. Okay. All right. Have a good one.